Now let's look at how we look at it, right? I just pulled some arbitrary leg, right? So you see with spastic performance here so that we understand what's going on and what we are going to work with. See, in this situation, there are several things which are present. So if we look at this typical situation, what we are going to see? First level, first level, first level of the problem, that would be the idea of the spasticity itself, right? So, in fact, that could be even zero level. Suppose we've got a newborn, you know, a relatively young child who is still hypotonic, not hypertonic, right, but presents the negative uh, syndromes, negative symptoms. So that will be the hypotonic child which, whose legs are too weak to begin, right? But then as the child grows and becomes two, three, four years old, then we can observe the visible manifestations of the spasticity. What does it mean? That it's still possible to extend the leg, right? So you see to go through the so-called range of movement. But if you do so, you're going to get the abnormal increased resistance of the hamstrings. So that would be the spasticity. And as you've seen there, so spasticity being seen as the kind of permanently contracted condition of the muscle, which is resisting the stretch. So then, as the muscle is perceived to stay for a long time in this contracted condition, so the muscle starts shortening, right? So you see that's shortening. So the length decreases. And as the length decreases on a more and more permanent basis, then you've got the contracture, right? So you see the contracture is the situation when you can no longer change the range of the movement and the whole thing is in that kind of limited mobility state. So that would be the typical stages. So behind this, say, uh, like usual appearance of the spastic leg for the child who is in say teenage years. So you are going to have this prior history and that would be the standard explanation behind. Now, how we are, and of course, just to complete it, in this situation, once you understand this history, right, spasticity, right, being the one which comes from the broken brain and keeps feeding this poor muscle, right, this muscle stays abnormally contracted and respectively shortens in length. So what would be the natural logic to deal with it and to prevent contractions? Well, the natural logic of this approach would be to do the natural things, right? So one, is to try to continue to bring it through the range, right? So you see, keep stretching this muscle. That's one logical move. And the second logical move is to do what, right? If it doesn't want to do so, if it's still being hyper, it shows hyper excitation from the central nervous system. So then the next logical thing is to do the local poisoning local poisoning that's the botox right so you see botox in that sense doesn't it's a local agent it's not central it's a local one so therefore that would be the idea if the muscle is performing the negative sorry the positive the excess syndromes from the top so what we are going to do here if we are medical professionals we are going to put the minus against the plus, right? So you see, this is a central plus, the central excess. The central inhibition is not working. So we are going to do the local poison, right? So you see, I mean, the local poison, I should have drawn this kind of, you know, the bones and uh, you understand, right? So you see the Jolly Roger, you know, the, the, the usual sign of the poison or kind of this kind of the chemical hazard hazardous material right so you see that will be botox so you have to remember that botulin is one of the strongest poisons known to men so 
in that sense, that's what they try to do. So they try to cause, the, bring the local suppression, the local poisoning to counter, to cover and kind of overlap the central hyperexcitation. That's what Botox is there. What is the justification for this? But okay, the brain is irreparably very broken. And besides of being broken itself, it keeps creating extra trouble through the contracted muscles. And via these contracted muscles, it creates all sorts of additional troubles for the joints and so on. So the lesser evil in this situation would be to inject poison, which at, yeah, which at least is going to help, well, minimize the damage as the contracture and as the, you know, deformation of the joint. That's the logic behind it, right? Of course, nobody is going to present it to you like this, that we are going to inject poison in your child to kind of, you know, get one wrong thing with the other wrong thing. We kind of try to do double wrong here and hope that out of the double wrong, double, you know, double inter, well, whatever, double, yeah, double disease would come uh, something healthy, right? So nobody is talking to you like that. So you're being told that Botox is to relax the muscles, right? So obviously it has nothing to do with the relaxation, it's poisoning. So that's the logic behind it. And that's why, but the muscle resists the poisoning, right? And even if it's once poisoned, then it kind of usually comes back. And it comes back with extra tone. So what is the explanation that typically given for that? And say, Jesus, you know, look at that. This muscle, you know, this brain injury is so bad that even after us doing this local suppression, the brain keeps sending those wrong signals so intensely that the spasticity rises again. So next Botox, next Botox, but usually a typical muscle can respond to let's say three to six botox injections because by the six botox injection is basically such a mess you know the muscle turns into such a lump that there is really hard to detect what is where it's just kind of a, a complete like blur it's no longer a clearly differentiated muscle so you can't really tell what is what you know it's just a mess MS as the M-E-S-S -S and as a M-A-S-S, -S, right? So you're just kind of muscle mass there. So that's what is being, what's the logic behind it, right? So the typical logic which is being given. Now, let's get our own perspective on this. What is our logic? Okay, let's change the colors to more positive. <laughs> let's get the green lights, right? So you see the green light. So I would repeat the basic thing over and over. The whole idea of ABR is very, very simple. So what is our central statement? Is that what has been lost during that hard landing on the planet Earth is their original 3D distribution. So that 3D print which was done in utero and put the very fine micro scale, well, micro scale and milli scale combinations when all the small connections would be kind of packed together. So to, to a certain extent, you know, if you want a sort of rough analogy, if you look at your mobile phone, right? So you see, if you look at your mobile phone, it has a, chip in it right so you see it has a chip and that chip is a tiny 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 thing right it's probably like a couple of millimeters thick but that chip has today i think it has up to 20 layers so 20 layers with a very distinct architecture so in that respect it's amazing how much you can put into such a tiny slot right and your anatomy is as complicated, but actually more, right? Because you, your anatomy implies not just the micro scale, right? 
you know, the micrometers, but it actually implies even the nanometers there, right? So, and this is an extremely effective and productive packing that we have in the phone, but on the other hand, it's relatively fragile, right? So you see if you, you know, smash this chip, you know, and you look at it, it's still from the outside is going to look the same way, right? So you see like, it's not going to break, but those 20 layers that refined internal architecture is going to be gone. So you're not going to get anything useful out of that chip afterwards. So the same thing, when that hard landing happened, that fine 3D print, that fine 3D convoluted super packing, super origami that your body is, has been undergone to the end of it basically collapsed and then had to restart again. And all, you know, like, and, and lots of those fine connections, they just been kind of destroyed. Because you see, if you think about the key properties, right? So you see, for example, the uh, capillaries, right? The capillaries, right? So, you know, the, the arteries uh, and then arteriolis and so on from the big blood vessels to the smallest capillaries. So what capillaries are? They are for the, you know, their actual uh, capacity, the throughput, right? So they're very, very thin. So if they're very thin, so their relationship between the volume and the total surface, right? So it's, it's a lot of surface for very little volume. So it's a great thing if you want to get a lot of metabolic exchanges there. But on the other hand, the capillary is easily collapsed. And once it collapsed, the forces required to reopen it, they are like 100 times greater than the ones which are necessary to just maintain it. And that's exactly the point. So that 3D thing collapses upon landing. So that's the first point. So then the brain cannot rely on that refined underground architecture. So second point is even more simple. So what is the basic principle. The basic principle is that 5% organization, so that human body is super efficient. You should only count their efficient, good functions, means that these functions which are being are done at 5% of the muscle involvement, these functions you count. Everything else is is a cheat, you don't count them because they lead to long-term disaster. They are not sustainable. So therefore, our only count is to keep their, develop the things which are able to run on that 5% of the muscular engagement. What do we need to do for that? A very simple thing, right? So you see what is our central message and the central logic that 10, thousand small connections which are in millimeters is much better than a hundred connections which are in meters. Actually, in American terms, that would be the connections which are the inch long, right? Or 10,000 connections which are fraction of an inch long are much better than 100 connections which are several feet or yard long, right? I hope the yards is still, so we don't want the yard long, we don't want the foot long, we want the inch and all sorts of the fraction of an inch long connections. That's a very simple thing, right? So, that's the essence. When you lose the inch long and fraction of an inch long connections as the basic ones, and you have to use the foot long connections to replace them, that's when you get spasticity. That's it. Spasticity is just a desperate participation where the brain just is put in the position that nobody else so normally it's a 5% action where muscles are just kind of steering those 
thousands of the small connections and kind of just reorganizing them. Here, the muscles, they have to do the heavy lifting. So that's really the essence of the spasticity. To put it in an even more productive and compact way, let's look at the other picture here. So let's ask Google to help us again. And let's do something like cross, cross section thigh. OK, so what do you see here? And what are the things that you see here? So that is the cross section, right? Cross section. So here is the bone. Here is the outer layer of the skin, and it has the fat. So the first thing that we have to understand, what is the number one stability property that, that the leg has to deliver? That's stability against torsion. How would you stabilize against torsion? You would use the outer perimeter, skin and fat, right? And you would connect that outer perimeter to your tightest tensional element, which is the bone. So you see, if you have this cross section, then, and try your own leg, try to rotate it, you rotate it, it springs back, you know, so it always comes back to this position, you know, it very, very quickly, and it's very strongly resisting the, the torsion. So that's the main plan. Now, here you've got the muscles, right? So you see this is, you see, this is the front of the leg. These guys, these guys, as you can see, they are very muscular here, okay? they are very muscular so if you look through see that's a larger chunk if you ask yourself a question which of these muscles has more of kind of lines in between the answer is going to be right so you see the natural candidates are here that would be the hamstring right and the medial hip because they have additional layers additional you know, divisions there. So they are the next dense part. So if because of that hard landing and the insufficient stimulation of the leg through the respiratory activity and so on and so forth, if for some unfortunate reason, your interaction, your connection between the around the bone is too loose if that velcro connection is not working or if your fat layer connection there is not being well enough 3d organized so what would you do you would obviously want to create another epicenter of resisting the twist right and what is it going to be well the next natural candidate to replace the bone as the epicenter of the torsional resistance to the, you know, across the thigh is going to be the hamstring and medial adductor, right? Now, let's look at the pictures, right? As we look at the pictures, what do we see? We see that, pop, pop, pop. We see, we see, we see, we see, we see this, right? So what are the usual problematic areas? The usual problematic areas are the hamstring, right? And the medial adductors. So this is really, that's, that is as simple as that. So, and this, this approach explains everything that happens you know, and which kind of being labeled as the centrally originating spasticity. You see, if you think about it this way, you know, now you want to replace the bone with the hamstring. So how would you want your hamstring to be? Because if the hamstring was originally designed to be a 5% muscle, right? So would you want your hamstring to be softer or would you want your hamstring to be tighter? Right, so the natural answer 
you would want your hamstring to be tighter. Now, as your leg grows and kind of comes and get and you know the torsional resistance has to the torsional loads increase. How would you want your hamstring to be? Would you want it to be more kind of refined muscular composition or more kind of the fatty and the fibrous tissue to resist it greater, right? So obviously it's going to be more fibrous and fatty. And well, the third or maybe the first question there, if you look at the hamstrings and actually in Spanish, it even has a good name, you know, in, in Spanish is very anatomical name. It's called the ischiotibialis, right? Meaning it starts at the ischial tuberosity and goes all the way to the tibia. And if you ask yourself a question, right? So if we get back there, when you look at draw the leg, the thigh, so the bone is called the femur, right? So should you hear the word femur? No, right? So there's no word femur there. Of course, sometimes it's being called biceps femoris, but this is actually the cheating word. So in reality, the main thing is the ischiotibialis connection. So therefore, what you would want, you would want your connections, your attachments between the ischial connection, right? The, on the pelvis and the tibialis connection on the leg, you would want them to be as close as possible. So this thing is going to be as reliable as possible. So that's it. The brain in that respect is a desperate user of the hamstring as the element which is replacing the source of the stability. And you see, that whole understanding leads us to one more important message. What is more important for the body? Mobility or stability? So, and that's really the central thing. So all this kind of conversation about mobility and so implies that mobility is important. Mobility is secondary. Mobility comes, you know, like, Degrees of freedom are everywhere. Control and organization comes through the constraints. So the body is at first place is a self-stabilizing entity. So that's why self-stabilization always takes priority over, over externally attributed movements. So that's why the brain would do everything in its capacity sacrificing those voluntary movements as just an icing on the cake and as a kind of complete bonus for the sake of maximizing their self-stabilization against the external forces which are coming in the torsional form. So that's really the essence. And that's why when people try to do the stretching, are they helping? Of course not. Right, because basically they are just telling the brain, well, you have to speed up the, you know, like the tightening of the, the fusion of this muscle. Right, the more you try to stretch this muscle longitudinally, the more you are sort of destabilizing it. But therefore, because its primary stabilization is cross-sectional, you try to stretch it longitudinally, it will kind of merge and fuse even quicker in the cross-sectional way. It will glue with the skin, glue with each other, you know, like morph and, 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 and merge. And if you inject poison in it, well, as you inject poison in it, of course, it weakens that resistance, right? To the, to, weakens the torsional stability. So what's going to happen is going to be very quick layout of the fiber, which is going to try to overcome these Botox injections. So that's really the logic of the whole thing. And our job is actually very, very simple. So what we are looking at, you know, we are looking at those cross sections and saying, okay, you know, how we are able to improve the situation. So you see, we look back at that cross section and we start looking at the ways, you know, we kind of recall the fact that in first place, it's that for every muscle fiber, 
there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of their connective tissue fiber. So in that sense, the muscles as motors, they're always integrated into that transmission, which is organized by the connective tissue. And also the muscles, they are slow. The muscles have large delays, right? So the fastest that the muscle can react is, you know, one tenth of a second. So meaning that anything that happens with the immediate reaction force from the ground or anywhere else has to be handled by something else. The muscle is just too slow. So, and we also remind ourselves that everything in that sense, in first level, in first and foremost, is the connective tissue. So in that respect, the fat and the bone, technically speaking, osteogenesis and adipogenesis, they go hand in hand. They are kind of coordinated processes. And again, it's not my statement. It's the statement which you can get, for example, in the book on this, which is, discusses the brown fat and the development of the fat. So what is our job? Our job is to start stimulating those Velcro connections within, restart, start restoring those properties. And that's where we have this new or relatively new breakthroughs with the Vibra tools, because the Vibra tools, which are working at the speed of one fifteenth of a second or one thirtieth of a second and so on, they're allowing us to target the ligaments, right? So you see they allow us to tar target the structures that react faster than the muscles. So we are also able to reach to the level of the interfaces with the bone and so on. And of course, all the other things, right? So you see the wrappings, the wrappings are there for, this, for the purpose of the distribution because the muscles are anyway creating some activity, but this activity in the problematic situation stays within the muscles. It doesn't channel out of the muscle into the neighboring connections, distributing connections. So we need to create those artificially, artificially because for the fibroblasts, which are the constituents and the remodelers of the connective tissue, they don't know that the muscle cells exist. You know, for them, they only know the source of tension. If the tension is delivered and distributed to them, they happily do the remodeling. If the tension is not delivered to them, they just hibernate. So, and of course, that's where we also have the, you know, the, the bigger idea of the, uh, you know, if the child is, uh, you know, sleeps well and so on. That's where we, and we can, for example, do the machine uh, applications during the access, ABR exercises or during the night. So that gives us the additional, the additional factor to bring that cross-sectional stimulus, which facilitates the development of all these connections. So, and that's exactly what we see. So in that respect, we are not fighting spasticity in its classic way, right? We are not talking about fighting with spasticity as the upper motor neuron syndrome, right? We are not fighting with the spasticity at all. We are not fighting, right? So you see, we are just highlighting that the spasticity as that, you know, high super reaction to the, you know, accelerated move longitudinal comes from the fact that the whole system tries to stabilize in the transverse uh, stabilization first. And that's why the secondary longitudinal responses, they are just kind of, you know, kind of interfering with that. And our point is not to fight with anything. We just want to build and bring those distributed connections. So, and that's really the logic. The logic is that simple. So yes, the brain is trying to desperately use 100 muscles to substitute, you know, 1 million or whatever, 100 muscles to substitute 10,000, you know, 
inch long connections, right? So you see, instead of the 10,000 inch long connections, the brain uses maybe 100 foot long connections. And it's not working very well, but it's the best that the brain can do in this current situation. Because, you know, unless, because normally all the inch long connections, they are formed during the in utero period and they are being already pre-established. So the brain is actually relying on them working reliably when developing the next level of functions in the, you know, once you've landed on the planet Earth, right? So, and we actually don't even do anything about those, right? Besides of the fact that we can do some additional, maybe discharge activities right just not to fight with them but to because those muscles they accumulate they become those epicenters and they uh, don't have the capacity for the spontaneous release so that's why they could become uncomfortable and so on so that's where we help them with some relief right just a discharge but they are not like when people ask me well i mean i started doing the ball uh, uh, following the, the the quadriceps, so you see, is it go? Sorry, along the hamstrings, is it going to sort and solve the problem of the you know hamstring spasticity? Well, the answer is well. On the one hand, it's kind of going to enrich the hamstring itself, but the most importantly, it will discharge that discomfort, uncomfortable tension through it. But the primary logic still remains that we actually want to restore that cross-sectional integrity. So where the bone will be play, the more the bone plays its tensional role, the better, right? So you see, it's like simple equation. So if the bone takes 100% or whatever, 95% of the, together with the fat and skin, the, the, this combination takes 95% of the torsional stability and the hamstring plays only 5%, then everything is good. But then if the bone plays whatever, say 10%, and the hamstring has to be responsible for 90% of the torsional stability, you get the problem. So, and how do we deal with this, right? So you see our job is to increase their component, the participation of the bone and fat there, right? So from 10%, to 15 to 20 right but once it's 20 percent here now the hamstring will be happy and will reduce from the 90 percent contribution to the 80 percent contribution and then from if it's 30 from the bone then happy hamstring would go down to 70. and of course there are some critical things right so like 50 50 70 30 and so on but that's a very simple thing so we don't have to fight and you know, all we leave those foot long connections alone with just some help to make them less uncomfortable but our main focus is on those 10,000 small inch long connections so that's really their approach to spasticity let's move on into the chat and the question and answers right we will say goodbye to uh, facebook facebook viewers and move to the private AVR families questions and answers. Okay, so thank you for Facebook viewers, you know, current and uh, future ones, right? And again, please, you know, because this webinar is going to be the recording we're going to have on our page. So, you know, don't hesitate, share it with the other families because, you know, this is actually the important thing that, well, that I try to be as user-friendly as possible because on the one hand, this kind of, you know, open information is there, but uh, I doubt that you really extract the meanings well from those uh, cryptic texts about the upper motor neuron syndrome and about the, all the other things, right? So if you think, if you find it helpful, so please share it with the other families, all right? Cheers, Facebook viewers, bye-bye.